Alrighty, so in this video I'm going to take a look at the section A of the specimen paper for the full A-level physics. So um, this isn't just for the year after year 12, this is to be done at the end of year 13, but it's based on year 12 kind of content. Okay, so let's get cracking. So a common type of smoke detector contains a very small amount of americium 241, and we've got its nuclide notation there. So what I want us to do is determine the number of each type of nucleon in one americium 241 nucleus. Um, so the proton number of proton is easy, uh, it's just 95, uh, so let's get that one first. Okay, so we've got that down there. Next we need to work out the number of neutrons, so we're going to do the nucleon number minus the number of protons, that should give us the number of neutrons. So that's what we've got here. We've calculated the number of neutrons by doing the difference between nucleon number and proton number, 146. So that's our second type of nucleon involved. Let's carry on. Okay, americium-241 is produced in nuclear reactors through the decay of plutonium-241. And that's got a, a proton number of 94. So we can see that the proton number increases by 1, but the atomic number stays the same. Say the decay process responsible for the production of americium 241 explaining your answer. Um, so firstly, we if the nuclear number stays the same but proton number changes, that's going to indicate some sort of beta decay. And if you increase the proton number, that tells you it's beta minus decay because a neutron has turned into a proton. Okay, so... Um, we know it's a beta minus decay, so that's the stating part of it. Um, it so the first thing I said is because the nuclear number stays the same. And the second part is talking about the fact uh, the proton number increases by 1, so a neutron has turned into a proton essentially there and that would be your answer to this question there. Okay so let's move on to the next question. So we've got americium 241 decays into nuclide x by emitting an alpha particle. Write the equation for this decay and determine the proton number and nuclear number of x. So let's first put americium down so americium 241 95, uh, I'm pretty sure it's AM, and then what we're going to do is it's going to lose four nucleons, two, three, seven, it's going to lose two protons, so that's 93, leaving us with, it said nuclide X, whatever that is, and then we have an alpha particle or a helium nucleus also being produced there. And so uh, it says it wants us to specifically identify its nuclear number. Well, that's 237. It says it specifically wants its proton number. Well, that is 93 because it's lost four nucleons and two protons there. Hopefully nice and straightforward. Okay, so let's continue on. Alpha radiation is produced by americium 241 causes the ionization of nitrogen and oxygen molecules in the smoke detector. Explain what is meant by ionization. So, uh, to ionize something, you can remove electrons from it. In theory, you can add electrons to things as well, but typically, uh, it's in the certainly in particle physics, it will be the removal of electrons. Okay, uh, so fairly, again, fairly straightforward, but the particle physics stuff always is. A friend who has not studied physics what an idiot! Who doesn't study physics? Anyway, let's carry on. I digress. Suggests that a smoke detector containing radioactive material should not be sold. Use your knowledge of physics to explain why a smoke detector containing americium 241 does not supply any risk to the user. So, um, alpha radiation is only dangerous if you either inhale it or ingest it. Smoke detectors are way up on the ceiling, and 
you'll, I say at most times, the closest you get is about a meter from your smoke detector. Alpha has a range of a few centimeters, so that's not going to be uh, a problem. And frankly, your smoke detector doesn't contain that much alpha radiation anyway. So let's put those two things down. Alrighty, so we've got that there. Um, that should finish off question one. Let's move on. Alrighty, so moving on to question two, we're now looking at uh, force versus extension, so some materials kind of stuff. So they're going to add a series of masses to a vertical metal wire, so we're like just hanging them on the end. We've got a circular cross-section area, and we're looking at the extension, or how the force, or the mass, changes the extension. Okay. So the first thing he wants us to do is mark on the point P the limit beyond which Hooke's law is no longer obeyed. So uh, for those of you who don't remember, Hooke's law is that force and extension are directly proportional up to the limit of proportionality. So essentially that law ends when it stops being a straight line. Um, so we're going to have a point somewhere around about this point here. That's where it stops being a straight line. Okay, outline how the student can use these results and other measurements to determine the young modulus of the wire. So let's first work out what the gradient of the graph represents. So I'll just do that over here on the left hand side. Uh, so young modulus is stress over strain. Uh, stress is force divided by area. Strain is extension, so I'll call that x, uh, divided by original length, so that goes up there. So on the graph, we've got force on the y-axis, so let's make force the subject. And we've got extension is our x, and then everything else is going to be the gradient of it. So uh, that's going to be the young modulus times the cross-sectional area divided by the original length. Uh, so all of this is the gradient and then the force is your y variable and x is x um, so that's why we've got a straight line graph going through the origin so in terms of using these results what we're going to need to do we're going to need to measure the cross-sectional area using a micrometer we need to measure the original length using a meter ruler we're going to need to determine the gradient of the graph and then multiply the gradient by the length divide by the area and that will give us the Young modulus. Alrighty, so um, let's get that down. Alrighty, and that's what we've got here. So those are the two parts. Okay, uh, so that's how we would get the young modulus. Let's flip over. Alright, so the next question wants us to draw on the graph what would happen when we unload the wire. Uh, so that's what I've sketched over here, uh, just rather than flipping back and forth. Uh, what you'd have is the blue is the original line, the red line is the new line, what will happen as you unload it. So you should see it leaves a permanent deformation and the straight line should be parallel to the straight line section of the original graph. In terms of why, uh, we've broken some of the bonds in the material because we applied a very large force to it. So that's why we get a permanent deformation, but we still got the same bonds, which so they're going to apply the same force. So it's going to react and extend in the same way as before. That's why we get it being parallel. So let's get that down. All right. So that's what we've got there. Ah, whoops. Um, so that's the shape of our graph. Let's continue down. So the metal wire is you used to make a cable of diameter 6 millimetres. The young modulus is 2.0 times 10 to the 11. Calculate the force necessary to produce a strain of 20% in the cable. So we can calculate the stress. Stress is equal to the young modulus times the strain. Uh, so that's going to be uh, 0.2, we need to convert that back into a fraction, so 0.2 times 100, and then times it by the Young Modulus, then to the 11, and that comes out as uh, 4 times 10 to the 8 uh, Pascals, let's write that as, and we should know that 
stress is force divided by area. So force is going to be uh, stress times area, so 4 times 10 to the 8 times by 6 times 10 to the minus 3, because it's 6 millimetres squared times pi divided by 4, because it, we want the area, we've got the diameter. And when we do that, uh, let's grab the old calculator. When we do that, we get 11,309. Uh, so Let's give that two significant figures, which would be appropriate. So 1.1 times 10 to the 4 newtons would be your final answer there. All right. Um, the cable is used in a crane to lift a mass of 600 kilograms. Determine the maximum acceleration with which the mass can be lifted if the strain in the cable is not to exceed this. So we know the maximum force on the cable can be 11,309. So what we need to do um, is, so the maximum resultant force we can provide is going to be the um, 11,309 minus the weight force of the object. So 600 times 9.81 and that gives us an overall force. Let's do that now. So minus 600 times 9.81. And that gives us a value of 5,423. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Acceleration is force divided by mass. So that's that 5,423, blah, 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 divided by 600 giving us a value of uh, it's 9.039 so uh, 9.0 meters per second squared because it's acceleration all right so that's 2.6 let's uh, flip over to the last part of two uh, an engineer redesigns the crane to lift a uh, 1200 kilogram load at the same maximum acceleration. Discuss the changes that can be made to the cable of the crane to achieve this without exceeding the 0.2% strain. Um, so if we want to, if we double the, if we get the same acceleration and double the mass, we need to double the resultant force it can provide, and we've also doubled the weight force. So what we need to do is essentially double the stress that the cable can take and the way we would do that is by doubling the cross-sectional area and the other thing you could do is then uh, instead of doubling the area you could double the young modulus so again for the same stretch you got half the strain so those would be your two things there so let's get those down so Alrighty, and that's what we've got there. For, um, for those of you wondering why the force is ending up being doubled, so the force provided by the cable, if you remember from the previous part, was the weight force, which is mg, plus the resultant force, plus ma. So if you double the mass of the object, you essentially double the force the cable has to take. And so what I'm saying here is to keep the stress the same, what you could do is you could double the cross-section area. Or if your stress doubles, you could have uh, double the young modulus. So you only get uh, the same strain overall there. Um, either of those two things would give you what you want. All right, so that finishes question two. Let's carry on. And what we have here is a very tasty looking circuitry question. So we've got some uh, cells with no internal resistance. And we've got currents in the direction shown by the arrows. So you can see those on the diagram. And we've got R1, uh, which is up here, is a variable resistor with a resistance that varies between 0 and 10. Write down the relationship between currents I1, I2, and I3. So this is using Kirchhoff's current law. Um, so the sum of the currents entering a junction is equal to the sum of them leaving. So the total entering uh, the junction I'm going to look at is this one up here at the top. So entering it is I1 
and I2, they're both going in, and I3 is coming out, so you must have this relationship here, which is essentially an expression of conservation of charge. So every charge that goes in has to come out, is what that's saying. So R1 is adjusted until it has a value of 0 ohms. State the potential difference across R3. Well, the way I look at this is to actually completely Ooh. completely forget about this stuff over here on the right hand side, and we're just going to focus on this loop in your circuit. We'll bring in this later on. So when R1 is not zero, essentially this 10 volts is divided between these two resistors. You've got a potential divider, uh, is the idea. So when R1 becomes zero, the 10 volts is no longer divided between two, the 10 volts is just across this one. So that would make the potential difference across R3 10 volts. There. Okay, and we know this uh, because essentially what I've just used is Kirchhoff's series voltage law. So potential difference across here plus the potential difference across here must be equal to the potential difference across here. We could also apply it the same way around on this one. So potential difference across here, potential difference across here must be equal to 12. So those two things will be useful, um, but it's the first one that's more useful to us here because we know our one's zero. So it wants us to determine, determine the current I2 um, at that point. So if the potential difference across here is 10 volts and the total around this loop is 12, the potential difference across here must be 2 volts. So what we can do is we can do current is the potential difference across a component divided by its resistance. So 2 volts divided by the resistance of that component, which is 10, and that gives us a value of 0 0.20 amps to two significant figures there. Um, okay, so so what I want to do is state and explain what happens to the potential difference across R2 as the resistance of R1 is gradually increased from zero. So we know potential difference across R2 starts at two volts. We can see that from the diagram. So if we increase R1, what's going to happen is the potential difference across R3 is going to decrease because if it increases across R1 it has to decrease across R3 because they have to add up to give 10. And if the potential difference across R3 decreases that means the potential difference across R2 must increase because the potential difference across R3 plus the potential difference across R2 must add together to give 12. So what's going to happen is it's going to increase so that's stating what's going to happen and then we'll put what I've just said into text now. All right, so that's what we've got there. Um, you shouldn't use this shorthand in your answer, um, but it's just quicker for me to do it on here. Where I've written PD1, what I mean is the potential difference across resistor 1, uh, etc. So what I've done is essentially I've used Ohm's law to explain what happens to PD1. I've used Kirchhoff's series law to explain what happens to PD3. And then the series law to the other side of the circuit to look at what happens to PD2. Um, so that's what's going on there. And that's why PG across 2 increases. Uh, good, good circuitry question one. That's really nice. Okay, so the speed of an air rifle pellet is measured by firing it into a wooden block su suspended from a rigid support, but the whole system can swing freely at the end on a string. This whole setup, incidentally, is called a ballistic pendulum. Um, just for those who want to go find out a bit more about how this works. Um, so essentially what you can see here, the pellet comes in, collides with the block and transfers its en kinetic energy and momentum to the block bullet system. And you can see what happens is it causes the block to rise by a, a displacement of 0.63 meters. So we've got an increase in GPE. A pellet of mass 8.8 grams strikes a stationary block and is completely embedded in it. The center of mass of the block rises by 0.63 meters and the wooden block has a mass of 450 grams. Determine the speed of the pellet when it strikes the wooden box. So when uh, the pellet strikes, it has kinetic energy. And in this system, that's transferred to GPE. That's the general idea behind what's going on. So let's work out the GPE of the block afterwards. Uh, that's mg delta h, 
so the mass is four. Uh, let's convert it to kilograms actually. So 0 0.4 four five eight eight. Oh god, this pen is horrific. Uh, that's its mass because it's the pellet and the block combined times 9.81 times by 0.63. Uh, so let's calculate that first of all. So 0.54588 times 9.81 times 0.63 uh, gives you um, a value. And we do that of 2.8355. Whatever. So that must be the kinetic energy of the block once the bullets collided with it because we can't be losing energy while it's swinging up so that must be equal to the combined kinetic energy of the block uh, so we can then calculate kinetic energy so what we're going to do is times it by 2 divided by the mass uh, let's square root the whole thing uh, so let's do that so I'm going to do that answer times 2 divided by 0.4588 square root gives us uh, 3.51576 meters per second so that's the speed of the bullet and block before they start rising and those of you wondering why i've put gp in here instead of kinetic energy is because kinetic energy and gp are equal to each other that's what's going on there so that's the speed of them when they combined but that's not the speed of the bullet when it strikes the wooden block we still need to work out what that is so what we need to do is work out first of all the final momentum because the initial momentum will be equal to that so the momentum afterwards is going to be the mass times the velocity so we're going to times that our answer by 0.4588 and that gives us 1.61 newton second so that's the momentum after uh, the momentum initially must be equal to that because you can never lose momentum. So that means the initial velocity must be equal to the final momentum divided by the initial mass. So let's divide our answer divided by the initial mass, which is just the bullet to start with. Convert it into kilograms and let's calculate that answer. We get 183.229, uh, which would be 1.8 times 10 to the 2 meters per second to 2SF, which would be appropriate here. So uh, quite a long chain of working there, but that's a really nice question there. I like that a lot. Let's move on to the next part. So the wooden block is replaced by a steel block of the same mass. The experiment is repeated with the steel block and an identical pellet. Uh, the pellet rebounds after striking the block. Discuss how the height of the steel block uh, compares with a 0.63 um, and we need to talk about energy and momentum to explain it. So when an object rebounds it experiences a greater change in momentum which means it's experienced a bigger force. Therefore, the thing it collides with experiences a bigger force too. That's what Newton's third law tells you. And if you've ever been paintballing, you'll find it hurts a lot more if the paintball bounces off than if it splats you. And it's the same thing there. When stuff rebounds, it exerts a greater force on the thing it rebounds off. Um, so if that's true, that means you're going to give more kinetic energy to the block in that collision and in more kinetic energy means it's going to get more gp and go to a larger height that's the general idea let's get that down all right so that's what we've got we've got the first part there so the bullet rebounds it experiences a greater change in momentum than if it's just being brought to rest by the collision and if it's going to have a bigger change in momentum it's experiencing a bigger force so if the bullets experience a bigger force from the block, the block has experienced a bigger force from the bullet, and that means it has more kinetic energy to start with.
that's our starting point. Alrighty, and that's what we've got there. So then, more kinetic energy using conservation of energy means it has more final GP, and so that means it's going to achieve a larger height there. Okay, so that's that one there. So last part, uh, discuss which experiment is likely to give the more accurate value for the velocity of the pellet. So let's think about this. So the first calculation we did, we didn't need to make any assumptions because the bullet became stationary, so we could assume all of its momentum was transferred to the block. When, if that's not the case, we're going to have to model this as an elastic collision because that's the only way we're going to be able to proceed forward uh, with the question. If we don't know it's an elastic collision, we're basically stuffed and can't calculate this. So we're going to need to assume it's an elastic collision uh, because we don't know the velocity of rebound of the bullet and uh, there. So that's we're going to have to make an assumption there. And um, realistically, that's not a particularly valid assumption, mainly because there basically are no elastic collisions out there and the bullet's going to be deformed by the collision, that kind of thing. Um, so the steel method is not likely to give particularly accurate results because of that assumption and the fact that that assumption isn't particularly valid. So let's get that down. Alrighty, so that's what we've got there. That's how I, I'd explain this and give get two marks for this question. Okay, so that's question four. Let's go on to question five. Uh, so question five, describe the structure of a step index optical fiber outlining the purpose of a core and the cladding. So uh, the core is where the light or whatever, sometimes ultraviolet, sometimes infrared, actually travel. So they would travel inside the core and the cladding is there to protect the core and also its lower refractive index to ensure that the total internal reflection occurs uh, and so the light doesn't leave the core. So let's get that down. Alrighty, so that's what we've got there. Um, Alright, so that's the general structure. I'm not sure why we had so much space. I guess we could have uh, drawn it if we wanted to. Never mind. Alright, so a signal is transmitted along a 1.2 kilometer length. Um, we've got a square pulse of white light uh, that's going along the centre of a fibre. So if it's going along the centre, we don't need to worry about multi-path dispersion, but we might need to worry about material dispersion uh, using white light, which I'm guessing this question's about. So we've got the refractive index and the wavelength of the two most extreme wavelengths, so blue and red. Explain how the difference in refractive index results in a change in the pulse of white light by the time it leaves the fiber. So essentially, if you have a higher refractive index, that means you are traveling slower because refractive index is the ratio of speed of light to vacuum and the speed of light in the material. So uh, blue, you can see, has a higher refractive index, which means it's traveling slower than red. So that's going to make the pulse we've sent down undergo what's called pulse broadening. Um, so essentially that's what's going on. Let's, let's write that down. All right. And that's what we've got there. So that's why we get a broader um, pulse because of the slightly different times it takes them to reach the end. So discuss two changes that can be made to reduce that effect that we've just seen. Uh, well, first of all, we could use a monochromatic source of light. So instead of having white light using just red or something like that, again, uh, that would get rid of that phenomenon. Um, and the other thing you might want to do is you can fix pulse broadening at intervals along your optical fiber if you know it's going to happen. So that's something you could do. Um, and then you could also try and make sure as far as possible that light can only take one path through your optical fiber so you avoid multi-path dispersion. So you can make your core, uh, core narrower to make that happen. So let's put those down. Okay, so that's what we've got there. Uh, you might know uh, multi-path dispersion as modal dispersion. The two words are typically interchangeable there. Um, either is fine. Okay, so that's uh, that one right there. Uh, let's move on to question six. 
Um, so these are one of my favourite things about the new uh, physics course, because we've got these fantastic questions which mean they give you some information and expect you to deal with it exactly like a physicist would, which is brilliant and stops people just trying to memorise physics, which is also a desirable outcome. So this one's about measuring speed of sound. So uh, I'm just going to take a minute to read through this. I suggest you do the same. Uh, so I'm just pause it as you do. Right, so now I've read it, let's uh, start having a look at some of the questions. Suggest an experiment that would demonstrate the wave nature of sound. Um, so uh, sound, something you could do is uh, cause it to diffract. That's a wave behavior. You could also cause it to interfere. So you could get sound wave to make an interference pattern. Either of those two things would help give you evidence. All right, so those are two possibilities. Uh, they're probably more straightforward just to get it to diffract around something, to be honest. Uh, but either of these two would definitely verify you're dealing with a wave rather than a particle. Let's carry on. So using Gassendi's value for the speed of sound, um, even tells you what a line is, how nice. Calculate the time between seeing the flash of a gun and hearing this bang over a distance of 2.5. So we're going to assume, we're assuming that light travels infinitely quickly so that means the flash arrives at time zero so we just need to work out the time for the sound so we're assuming its speed is a constant so we can just do displacement divided by the velocity so 2500 uh, divided by the value he got which was 480 uh, if we do that let's plug those in 2500 divided by 480 is going to give you uh, a time of 5.2 seconds which seems uh, something that is reasonable to measure even in the oldie days explain why it was necessary to assume that compared to the speed of sound the speed of light is infinite um, basically you needed to uh, well they didn't actually know what the speed of light was at the time which is one thing. Uh, so it really simplifies um, the uh, working out the speed of sound um, because a speed of light is so much faster anyway. Realistically, that's not going to have much effect on the measurement. All right. So that's what we've got there. It's about recognizing what you actually calculated and then how the assumption allows you to then use that to calculate the speed of sound. Um, so it says, explain one observation that could have led Gassendi to conclude that the speed of sound does not depend on the frequency. Um, so essentially, whenever you create a sound, you never just create one frequency. Like when you fire a gun, that's going to create a range of frequencies and a range of different harmonics of those sound. And if they all arrive at the same time, you would, you would then conclude uh, the speed is independent of frequency. All right, so that's what we've got here. Okay, so then going on to question. Explain why the value obtained by Borelli and Viviani was much better than that attained by Gassendi. So the accepted value of speed of light is about 330. Um, so essentially it's closer to it, or which means it's more accurate. Uh, so... Uh, when, it's, when it says much better, it means it was it's essentially a much more accurate value. All right, so we get that. So for 6.6, .6, the speed of sound in dry air is given by this equation right here. Oh, we've even got um, a conversion into Kelvin there, all right, uh, where theta is the temperature degree C, K is constant, and then can we converting the temperature into Kelvin? Calculate a value for K using data from the passage. So we're going to want to use the most the accurate value. So we're going to use 331.29. And we're going to look at um, the temperature under which it was done, which was zero degrees. So uh, we're going to rearrange to find k. So k is the speed of light, light sound, I keep doing that, divided by the square root of 0 plus 
273.15. Da, da, da. So we've got, we can pick up the speed of sound at that temperature, so 331.25 divided by the square root of 273.15. Uh, so let's calculate that. 273.15 square root of that. Gives us 16 point five something. 331.25 divided by that answer gives us 20.045, which would be an appropriate number of uh, 20.043 to five significant figures, which would be appropriate because both of these numbers here are five significant figures. State the steps taken by the scientific community for a value of a quantity to be accepted. Um, essentially, um, somebody will carry out some research and will publish their figure, and then somebody else has to be able to repeat their experiment. So let's get that down. And that would be what needs to happen to get an accepted value. It's not if just one person can do it, it's if it, other people can do the same experiment and get the same answer. Okay, so I'm going to stop this video at this point. I will do the multiple choice section in a separate video. I hope you found that useful. If you spotted any errors or there's anything that's not clear, please do comment on this video and let me know. I can usually clear those things up. Uh, but thank you for taking the time for watching and I hope you found that useful.